All right, ladies and gentlemen. So today what I want to talk about and what I want to look at is the Mexican-American War, like I mentioned in the teacher message video. So if we remember, uh, we left off on Friday. Yes, Friday, talking about the Texas Revolution. Now, the Texas Revolution is going to be one major cause of the Mexican-American War. Uh, if you guys remember, the... United States had been kind of having this debate about whether to annex Texas or not. Mexico looked at Texas as part of Mexico. So if the United States annexed it, they would have a problem. Mexico would have a problem with the United States and it would definitely lead to war. So if we remember where we left off on the last slide uh, from Friday, the United States had the election of 1844. And the guy, a guy by the name of James K. Polk became president. Now, Texas had already been independent and had gained its independence in 1836. And they had been their own independent republic for about eight years. So the United States is kind of trying to figure this out. They're not sure if they want to have this fight and have this disagreement with Mexico. Well, the election of 1844, the main issue is whether to annex Texas or not. Ultimately, James K. Polk wins, and he is a big supporter of annexing or making Texas part of the United States. So as soon as Polk is elected, the president that is serving, is finishing out his last year and serving as president, John Tyler, decides that he is going to take and annex Texas because he looks at uh, Polk's election as the people saying that they want the United States to make Texas a another state. So what he does is he asks Congress to annex Texas to make it part of the United States. And in 1845, Congress votes and decides to annex Texas to make it part of the United States which causes Mexico to become very angry, pull all of their ambassadors out, and creates a lot of tension between the United States and Mexico. So now enter Polk. And Polk comes in with three objectives for his presidency. He wants to reduce the tariff or the tax on imported goods. Tariffs were very high at this time. Many of the previous presidents had wanted to protect American goods. But Polk, a lot of his support is coming from the southern states and from farmers. So he wants to help, excuse me, he wants to help southern states and farmers. And by lowering that tariff, it makes goods produced outside of the United States less expensive. So Polk decides to lower the tariff to 25%. And he also wants, the other two goals that he wants besides the tariff is to take sole control of Oregon and to take control of California. Now, with Oregon, Oregon has, the Oregon Territory has been jointly controlled by the United States and Great Britain since the Treaty of 1818. So they have both managed that territory, but Polk, wants to take complete and total control of all of the Oregon Territory. And part of that territory stretches into what is today Canada. As you can see on the slide, it says Polk wanted to control the territory as far north as the 54 degree, 40 minute parallel line, which, like I said, stretches north into what is today Canada. Now, there are a lot of people that wanted that line in the United States, wanted that to be the northern border of the United States. But there are many people in Canada that wanted the uh, a much more southern border. The Let me rephrase that. The people of Canada, people in Canada and leaders in Canada and leaders in Britain wanted the border between the United States and Canada to be much lower into what is today clearly the United States. So ultimately, uh, in the Oregon Treaty of 1846, it is decided that the border between the United States and Canada will be the 49th degree parallel line or the 49th parallel line, 
Um, it's the 49th latitude line. Everything north of that line is part of Canada. Everything south of that line is the United States. And that is still the border between the United States and Canada that we have today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. So the Oregon Treaty of 1846 set up the border between the United States and Canada all the way to the Pacific Ocean in the northwest area of the United States and of Canada. And it also took and thank you, Tamara, for submitting that. Um, it also took and uh, um, it also took and gave, like I said, gave the United States and gave Canada sole control of each of their parts. So now the United States has some parts of or the Oregon Territory, which is eventually going to become Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, the modern day states and part of the some parts of those modern day states. So Polk wants to take control of Oregon. He wants to reduce the tariff. He also wants to take control of California uh, in large part because he wants to gain access to trade with Asia um, and gain the very lucrative trade of spices and silk and stuff like that and goods produced in Asia. He wants to be able to take part in that. Um, so Polk is going to look for a way to take over California as well. Um, so his desire for California and troops in Texas led to war with Mexico once again. So we're going to see kind of how that uh, is going to evolve. But that desire for Mexico, or I'm sorry, that desire for California is going to be very difficult considering that Mexico owns California uh, and Mexico owns the land that is today California. So those are three things that Polk is going to try to do. It's going, California is going to lead to war, but Oregon and the tariff reduction are two things he's going to be able to do successfully without much of an incident. So let's take a look at what Polk does to try to really kind of settle the issue uh, between the United States and Mexico and how he's able to actually obtain and get California. Um, the main way he's able to do that is the Mexican-American War. So we're going to take a look real quick and see how it gets ignited, how it gets started, and what the ultimate results are and how long it takes and stuff like that. Excuse me. So Polk sends John Slidell to Mexico in 1845 to smooth over the Texas issue and to purchase California for $25 million. But Polk isn't banking on... Mexico just automatically doing that. As we know, the fact that the United States has annexed Texas has already gotten Mexico very angry with the United States. So it's not very likely that Mexico is going to agree to sell California or really let the United States smooth over that Texas issue. So what Polk also does is he sends John C. Fremont to survey California, and more importantly, he sends General Zachary Taylor and his 2,000 troops south of the Nueces River to the Rio Grande. So there is a bit of a border dispute in Texas. The United States believes that one river is the border between the United States and Mexico, and Mexico believes that a completely different river is the border between the United States and Mexico. So let's just take a look real quick. I have a map to show you, and it actually almost showed up. All right, so if we look right here at this line right here, this blue line where the modern-day border of Texas and Mexico is, this is the Rio Grande River, and this is what the United States believes is the border between Texas and Mexico. Now, on the flip side, the Nueces River is this river right here. And Mexico believes that this river is the border between the United States and Mexico. And all of this territory in between is disputed territory where both the United States and Mexico believe that they control that land, that this is owned by them. So Polk really doesn't think that Mexico is going to allow them to purchase California and he really doesn't think that they are going to sell. So what he does is he sends Taylor 
to the Rio Grande to really kind of spark that fight and to give the United States a reason to declare war on Mexico. So you have this standoff. And finally, in April 1846, Mexican troops fed up with United States, the United States Army and Zachary Taylor standing at the Rio Grande River in what they perceived to be Mexico. They crossed the Rio Grande and they attacked Taylor's men camped in the disputed territory. So after this attack, Polk requests the United States and requests Congress to declare war on the United States. Congress does decide to do that in a little over a year and a half. The United States is able to defeat Mexico and win the Mexican-American War. So Fremont and the Navy are able to seize California. American troops are able to seize most of present-day New Mexico and Arizona. Taylor's able to seize all of northern Mexico after a victory at the Battle of Buena Vista. And General Winfield Scott, in September 1847, is able to march south to Mexico City and able to conquer the capital of Mexico and end the, Mexi the Mexican-American War. And with that victory, the United States and Mexico signed what is known as, whoops, we're one too far, guys, sorry, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ends the Mexican-American War. It's signed in 1848, and the, there are two, four provisions to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mexico is going to give California and most of present-day New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, and Wyoming to the United States. The United States is going to gain a large area of land, and it's going to be an area of land that is about the same size, if not larger, than the Louisiana Purchase. So that's the first part. Mexico is going to abandon its claims to Texas. Mexico can no longer take back control of Texas. It is now permanently a state of the United States and permanently under the control of the United States. The Rio Grande River was established as the border between Texas and Mexico. The Nueces River is not the border. Mexico, because Mexico lost, what they think is the border between the United States and Mexico is not. And the border that the United States believes and the United States views as the border between Texas and Mexico becomes the official border, okay? Um, so the Rio Grande is established as the border between Texas and Mexico, and the United States agrees to pay Mexico $15 million for all the lands acquired. Now, just think about that one for a second. The United States was going to pay Mexico $25 million just for California. Excuse me. But now, the Mexi now that the Mexican-American War has been fought, Mexico has to give up not only its claims to Texas, but Arizona, New Mexico, and California, land covering that entire area for $10 million less. Now, at least they get a little money, but they get far less than what they would have had. So the United States is able to gain a large area of land and is able to complete its quest for manifest destiny and its march to the Pacific Ocean. They are able to do that in 1846 when they signed the treat, the Oregon Treaty with Great Britain. And then in 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, they are able to take California and all of the land that used to be part of Mexico. Now they already had Texas, but they gain that large, this other large area of land here. And generally, because the Texas Revolution is seen as kind of one of the sparks and one of the causes of the Mexican-American War, uh, Texas is generally lumped in, the acquisition of Texas or the taking of Texas is usually lumped in with the rest of the Mexican-American War. And generally this area is known as the Mexican Session. So if you ever see that name or anybody ever says that name, it is the land that the United States gained through the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and by annexing Texas after the Texas Revolution. So at this point, the United States is able to cover land and owns land from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, and they are able 
to accomplish their quest for manifest destiny. Now there is a little bit more, this little area down here, up until 1853 and the Gadsden Purchase was part of Mexico. And just to kind of go over that, the U.S. negotiated the Gadsden Purchase with Mexico, which gave the U.S. the southern parts of Arizona and New Mexico for $10 million. The reason they did that is because when they purchased that land, they were attempting to build the Transcontinental Railroad, a railroad that went from the eastern United States all the way to the western United States. And they were afraid that um, they wanted that land, not so much they were afraid, but they wanted that land so that they could build. That was one of the paths they thought they could build a railroad in. And it would be the easiest way uh, to build it, and it would also give the South a little recognition and a little more power um, having that railroad in the southern part of the United States. If the entire transcontinental railroad travels in the North, that gives the North all the power and a whole lot of power over the economy. Whereas if it's built in the South, you have, you give the South a little bit of power. And at this point, the North has much more power than the South does. So this, the idea to purchase the Gadsden purchase was to give a little more power to the South, South by giving them part of the transcontinental railroad. That was the idea behind it. That's what they were going for. In the end, the United States had gone to war for many manifest destiny and many Americans were happy about the fact that they were able to, the United States was able to win everything that they did from the Mexican-American War and gain all of this land. But what they don't realize is that the gaining of this land is going to lead to kind of a re-aggravation or a kind of restarting of the disagreement between the North and the South over slavery. Northerners are going to try to prevent Southerners from taking slaves into the Mexican session, Southerners are going to want to expand slavery into the Mexican session, into what is today Texas, California, Arizona, New Mexico, all of the land that the United States has just gained. The North wants to prevent slaves from moving into and prevent, uh, more so prevent Southerners from bringing their slaves with them. Southerners want to expand. So this is going to be this disagreement, and that is how the Mexican-American War is really going to cause this disagreement between the North and the South and how it is going to lead to the Civil War and the outbreak of the Civil War. So one more time just to show you guys, uh, this is how the Mexican-American War allows the United States to achieve its goal of manifest destiny and to be able to control land and own land from the Atlantic Ocean, which is right here, all the way to the Pacific Ocean in the West. They have finally achieved it. They have finally accomplished it. They have achieved their manifest destiny, excuse me, at the conclusion of the Mexican-American War. With that said, guys, we will wrap the Mexican-American War up today. Uh, on Thursday, we'll talk about the gold rush, and that should complete our westward expansion. The next unit, we're going to talk about the next uh, main chunk of social studies we're going to talk about is the Civil War. This is the last thing that really contributes to the lead up of the Civil War. With that said, guys, I hope you have a fantastic day, and I will catch you guys tomorrow, hopefully, for our review lesson. Have a great day, guys.